Good evening, my name is Nancy Chen. I'm an educator in innovation and creativity, part of the Department of Learning and Public Engagement at the Art Institute of Chicago. Tonight, it is our pleasure to welcome you to an artist talk with songwriter and frontman of Wilco, Jeff Tweedy, in conversation with writer and curator, John Corbett. Their conversation will focus on Jeff Tweedy's new book, How to Write One Song, as well as his career as a writer and musician and the importance of making creativity a part of daily life. This program is presented as part of Artists on Artists, a public, ooh, a public program series that highlights the creative process and creative communities in Chicago and beyond. Through this series, leading artists, authors, musicians, and performers inspire new ways of understanding the museum's collection while making connections to their own practice. Just a little bit of housekeeping, um, panelists, silence your phones. The whole program will last approximately one hour. The program is being recorded and will later be available via the Art Institute's YouTube channel. Our channel, by the way, is a great place to catch recent programs. This program will be shared in presentation mode, so video and microphones have been turned off for all attendees. For optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under your view options in the top right corner of your screen. Closed captions are also available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. So we encourage you throughout the program to share your questions if you have them via the chat function. Some of these will be addressed during a brief Q&A session at the end of the conversation. Now to introduce our speakers for the evening, Jeff Tweedy is the founding member and leader of the Grammy award-winning band Wilco and the co-founder of the groundbreaking alt-country band Uncle Tupelo. He is one of contemporary music's most accomplished songwriters, musicians, and performers. In addition to four albums with Uncle Tupelo and over a dozen with Wilco, Jeff has recently released four solo albums, all comprising original compositions from his 30-year songwriting career. Jeff is also the author of two books, both of which appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. In 2018, Let's Go So We Can Get Back, a memoir of recording and discording with Wilco, etc. And last year in 2020, How to Write One Song, Loving the Things We Create and How They Love Us. John Corbett is a writer, curator, and producer. He is co-owner of the Chicago Art Gallery, Corbett versus Dempsey, which has produced a plethora of books and audio recordings of new and historical jazz, experimental and improvised music. John's most recent publications are Pick Up the Pieces, Excursions in 70s Music, and Vinyl Freak, Love Letters to a Dying Medium. As an essayist and reviewer, John has written for publications like Downbeat, The Wire, The Chicago Reader, The Chicago Tribune, NKA, Bomb, Lit Hub, and Lapham's Quarterly. With that, I will pass the virtual microphone to Jeff and John. Enjoy the program. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I am thinking we're going to be seeing one another side by side, but <laughs> so far that's not the case. How about you, Jeff? Are you seeing that? I am not seeing that yet. Ah, now I see you, which is Best. Outstanding. Okay. Great. Um, hey, how's it going? Hey. <laughs> How are you? Good. Really nice to talk with you this evening uh, and uh, excited to, to dive into this. I really, really have enjoyed both your books. Um, uh, so loved the memoir, I have to say. Um, got it right when it came out and devoured it and read it a couple of times, actually. Uh, uh, and, and like that book, I think the new one is so generous and such a, uh, an offering in a way. And so I'm going to hold it up so everybody sees it and do the plug type thing as if we were on Letterman or something like that. Um, and I want to ask, I want to start out just by asking you to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book um, and uh, what prompted you to want to write it in the first place? Um, I think the main thing uh, that prompted me to write the book was uh, 
having when I finished the memoir, uh, some of the most positive feedback I got uh, uh, about the book was from friends of mine who are writers and and um, creators, artists, and they liked the parts of that book that talked about creativity and really encouraged me to um, keep, uh, you know, kind of expand upon some of those chapters where I really delved into my process and things that I think about a lot and I like to talk about. And I didn't realize that that was um, uh, something that is, I don't know, there isn't a lot, there aren't a lot of books like that talk about it. There aren't a lot of books. Um, you know, songwriting books are generally either about the business and how to get your songs uh, placed in people's on people's records and they're from really from Nashville or something like that or they're they're really didactic you know uh, about things like rhyme schemes and and um, uh, you know chord progressions and and a, a lot of a lot more technical than the kind of book that I've always responded to are like uh, uh, critical writing books about, other people's art and and I apologize but I don't know how to turn that sound off if you're hearing it this is my wife's computer and if she keeps getting texts we're I'm gonna go insane uh is there any way to keep your your friends from liking you for a little while um so anyway we maybe we can just deal with it uh um, if it's not bothering anybody else, because I think the, the, the way we would have to deal with it is to go into her settings. What do you think, John? Should I? I think I it's OK. It? I think we all we're all familiar with that sound and we'll just treat it as like a, a nice background. You don't have any idea how popular my wife is, though. It's, it's I know. Well, if, we could be in trouble. That's true. Let's <laughs> but uh, plays. but yeah, so the, so the, the main thing was that I I. I, I didn't I couldn't really find many books that were specifically about like the philosophy of creativity, the idea of what it means to you in your life, the the how beneficial it can be to you. Um, and um, so I had this idea that I would write a, a book. I had the title called How to Write One Song. Uh, and I thought that would simplify it for myself to be able to organize my thoughts about it. And then, um, and then we were on tour with Wilco and the, and the pandemic hit and we had to cancel the rest of our tour and I, and I got home and, and um, I, don't, I don't respond well to not having something to do. So I, <laughs> I, I, I wrote the book in about three months at the beginning of the, the pandemic and, and um, you know, I, it was really good to be able to focus on something. And, and I, you know, I felt oddly, you know, really laser focused. So the writing came pretty, pretty quickly. So it was, uh, that's, that's the genesis. I mean, it's, I, I want to ask you about the one song thing in the first place, just to talk a little bit about why, why one, but before we get to that, just to say, I mean, it's interesting to me, I was thinking, reflecting on this book, I didn't know that you'd actually written it, uh, you know, during pandemic times. And I was thinking about its relevance right now. And one of the things that's so generous about it is that it, in a period where so much is out of control, out of our personal control, like mm -hmm. politics were out of our control for, you know, seemingly completely out of our control for an awful long time. And the pandemic, you know, feels like it's so uh, uh, so difficult to control. This offers people a way to think about something that they can control themselves. They can make something in the world, yeah. um, which which is such an you know. So now realizing that you'd actually you know it was a good example of that for you. It was like you sitting down and taking control of like making. It was a, it was a it was a, it was a perfect. Um outlet for uh me to be reminded of what it does for me to be creative at the same time i'm trying to write a book about what it, it, it does for me to be creative i was also writing you know love is the king the record that i put out this year at the same time so i was kind of doing all of the things that 
um, I've described to people uh, this notion that I feel like I I was pre pandemic, you know, like uh, as a person with a lot of uh, mood disorders and anxiety disorders and things like that. One of the the constant uh, sources of consolation in my life has been that I've learned how to do this thing that helps me come back into my body and disappear at the same time. You know, it has the, like this really, um, you know, really wonderfully soothing quality to, to it for me personally. And, and um, so it was felt pretty natural to be doing what I was doing in a time where that seems to be what I've always done when things have gotten a little bit uh, hard to fathom, <laughs> you know, like when my own mental health is hard to take, I've always relied upon that. And in high school, when I wasn't very happy, I would like either delve into other people's art and other people's music or, and eventually I learned how to do that to self-soothe, you know? So, yeah. So this, the, the book has this, you know, very emphatic, uh, how to write one song. It's not how to write a song. It's not how to write songs. It's not, it's definitely not how to be a songwriter. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about like, it's, it's not like how to write a better screenplay, you know, a book, as you say, that's more like a, a technical, uh, thing. It's really this inspirational, um, book, but, Talk a little bit about the the emphasis on the one song, because I think that's an important uh, germ in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's it's kind of a, di a distillation of the whole idea that we were just talking about um, in terms of what you can control, uh, what you have any influence over in in your life. You don't have influence over songs. You only have influence over this this next the next step that you can take and and then and the next the next right thing to do, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. and um, that's a behavior I've had to learn outside of songwriting for myself uh, to be able to separate the things that I have some influence over from the things that I actually can make a difference in and and. Um, it's liberating, I think, for people that, you know, and, and it's not something that you constantly remember. You always have to remind yourself to do that, I think. Um, from time to time, it becomes harder. But uh, I think that's the reality of it. I think you're never working on songs, even if you have a million songs going at one time that are all in varying states of being completed you can only really work on one song at a time. And, and um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I was worried that it would, be, would come across a little bit cutesy or something as like a, like a gimmick or something. Uh, but the, for me, uh, it's just a way to draw myself back into the, re, the, the, the essence of what it is that I do. I mean, it, it feels to me like the one thing as well, and I think you write this a little bit in the book, is, is also that if you get over that hump, if you're somebody who's concerned that you won't be ever able to write a song or make anything creative worthwhile to put into the world, once you do it the first time, it's, you're going to do it again. Like it becomes a kind of a, it's like siphoning something, you know? Yeah, or or, or you can or you can teach yourself to do it repeatedly. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think I, I, I definitely feel that way from time to time that um, I don't know how to write a song like the one I wrote five years ago again, but I'm teaching myself how to write the song that I feel like singing right now. Um, and, it, and it really is, you know, I, I have managed to become a person in this world that has to have songs to sing and likes to have new songs to share and things like that. But I think that that was sustaining for me even way before that happened. You know, I think yeah. the notion of making things uh, even as a kid was starting to become sort of a, 
there, I had an inkling that it was, it was the best part of me, <laughs> you know, the best, the, the, the part of me that was doing the best. <laughs> do you, do you feel like, uh, uh, I mean, another aspect of that is you do it once and then you begin to do it more times. I'll just say this for, for myself for a long time, it was very hard for me to tell whether I was getting any better at like, for instance, at writing, you mm -hmm. know, I, I felt like I came into it with a certain aptitude and then I couldn't tell whether I was getting any better at it. And uh, I wonder how, th how that feels, you know, in terms of, you know, looking at what you're writing in the book and then reflecting on yourself as a songwriter. Um, you know, that's one of the, you know, that might be skipping ahead a little bit. I don't know. Uh, because that brings to mind the idea of 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 uh, routine and yeah. having you know an established kind of practice, because um, that is kind of wonderful. That you, I do feel like I'm getting better. I I and I and I only can do that because I have so much marked progress over over the years where I can go back to work on a song that I started a long time ago and realize, oh, I can, wow, I can actually play the guitar better now. And little, little, this little nuances that maybe aren't even perceptible to anyone else. I mean, it's subjective, what, what whatever is it is that I'm being, that I'm projecting out into the world, that may not be getting better. That doesn't, but that doesn't concern me. What concerns me is that I feel more in touch with this thing that gives me so much, um, you know, joy and gratification. You know, like I that, you know, I feel. Uh, in some ways, it might sound a little bit too like it's like I'm making it out to be a craft or a trick or like a arts and craft kind of project, but I, it's like getting better at doing crosswords or something, you know, like there's like this gradual feeling like I get to the phrases and I get to the, the, what I'm hearing in my head faster. And I get to um, some emotion faster because uh, uh, I don't know, because it just keep those, I, I think just keeping that, that impulse open in a pretty constant way for me is it enhances not just um, writing music and make, making up songs. It, it, it makes me feel like I'm a little bit more open to my experiences with my family or like uh, walking down the street. Uh, there's a, there's a little bit more of a, uh, constant unfolding and a little bit more of a willingness to accept the world as be as as if it's being revealed to me because that's the way songs feel yeah that's that, that's an a, a a subtle undercurrent of the book as well i feel like is this kind of two-way street with creativity that creativity is about putting things out into the world but then the process of doing that makes you more open to the world as well or makes you recognize and identify and and even maybe even you know observe things that you hadn't before uh as a result so there's a it's a kind of it's not just about like uh taking things and making them into your own things it's about like also recognizing the things that are out there mm -hmm. it feels feels like that's a that's a, an aspect of it i mean like Let's talk a little bit about the routine habit schedule aspect of the book, because that's a it's important uh, as you're putting it. And one of the things that was really startling to me to read when you go, it's the very nice moment in in the book where you're talking about um, talking about the importance of routine. And then you talk about your daily routine and it starts at eight o'clock at night and which <laughs> might be very different from how many people's do. But that. I thought that was, I mean, it was great. It was this kind of, yeah, my day sort of starts here and moves along like this. And then you kind of put it in chunks and. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I hope I make it clear in the book that I don't expect that to be something that would work for many other people's lifestyles or, you know, it's not something available to everyone. Um, 
Um, yeah, that's clear. I think that's clear, yeah. but it's just a great revelation. <laughs> it's just sort of like, well, I mean, that, that nocturnal element is, uh, um, but I, but I, I'm interested in the idea that you have about creativity as part of a daily process. I mean, you call it like everyday work that, and that maybe links to this other more overarching question of, of the relationship that you have in the book to the notion of inspiration, right? Which is, I see the book as simultaneously demystifying the idea of inspiration and then also kind of leaving open the possibility of it still being a mystical. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, um, uh, I relate to, I relate to books about science and, um, some of <laughs> I don't know why I was reminded of this and what you're saying, but and I didn't write about it in the book, but like Carl Sagan's books were always kind of based around this notion that what is actually happening is way more exciting than pseudoscience. The idea of certain things like UFOs or, or Bigfoot is nowhere near as compelling as uh the way some of the universe works and, 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 and what we've discovered about uh, what's there and what mysteries are still there. Like the fact that we've gone to Mars with a probe, but we don't really know what's about a mile and a half down below the earth in most places. And, you know, so there's, there's, there's always, um, I feel like every day, if you really, if you really were in the mi right mindset, you could open up a whole nother world to explore, especially in the information age, especially with the internet and especially, you know, how, uh, how easy it is compared to when I was a kid. I was, I, I liked having the world book encyclopedia in our house. And I, and I, I looked at it that was, those were really some of the only books we had in our house when I was a kid growing up. And I, I really love, I felt like I was, I was responsible to know that <laughs> stuff. I would read it. And, and I think that that's the same way about like, um, uh, just exploring how it is that you make something. And some, some days I feel like I know what I'm, what I'm doing. And some days I don't but I still have a general idea of how to get there, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think it's, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is this term disappearing, which is an important term to you. And, and, and I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's at the heart of, of this is that sense of that, that question of disappearing, like, yeah, I think it's really it's related uh, in a very similar way. There's you know there's disappearing performing, you know, uh, music. I think if you don't disappear for performing music, you're you're not doing it right. You know, you you are putting yourself at risk, and and you're not giving yourself to the audience in a way. You know, um, but uh, I think. I just I just assume that other people feel like I do, and that there's an a, an enormous burden of self that is is kind of oppressive a lot of the time. You know, um, egos are difficult to to feed, and 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 they tend to the more needy they become, the more insecure you become, and so there's a great relief. And it's almost, I think, religious in a way, or, 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 or spiritual in a way, because um, I see other other parts of the world that seem to be addressing the same problem, and that is like the the uh, the communal aspect of going to see a show is like you know simultaneously being a part of something that isn't just yourself, and at the same time allowing yourself to disappear into something with people disappearing alongside you or something, you know, yeah. you know, and that's when it's working ideally. And those are the moments that, that 
really transports you, really seem to be sustaining. And, and, uh, and that happens for me when I'm really in touch with a creative impulse that I'm chasing or pursuing. And, and it really does happen where I'll look up and I have missing, missing hours, you know, mm -hmm. like I have, I have spent many hours doing this thing that I didn't even realize at some point I stopped realizing I was doing, and I was just, it was maybe doing it to me <laughs> or something, yeah. you yeah. know, it was being done to me, you know. But it, but it still has something to do with like, I mean, this idea of uh, ending the debilitating notion or, or feeling of self self doubt or self judgment. Mm -hmm. So getting yourself to a place where, and, and losing yourself in a way uh, requires that you not judge the thing that you're making necessarily, which, which is a, which is, there's all these kind of contradictions that are at the core of this. Cause in the end you end up judging it anyway, and you end up kind of, but there's this process of like, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to, I'm going to let go. I mean, one of the, one of the pieces of advice that you give as a way of kind of getting out of uh, breaking out of something is don't be yourself. <laughs> right. right. Which I like. And that whole idea of like, not, not, not succumbing to the ego's desire to constantly be remind everyone who you are and how special you are, but instead just sort of like, you know, maybe I'll try being someone else. I'll step out of my comfort zone yeah. in that sense. Right. Right. Write a, uh, write a song for, um, uh, you know, one of the Jetsons or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, but yeah, I think that you could set about if you're um, if you're struggling with that internal judge, uh, an internal voice that's critical, and you know you could set out, you could say to yourself, "I'm going to try and write the worst four line poem that anybody's ever written," and that would be no different in in, in terms of how beneficial it is to you at the end of the day than thinking I'm going to write the best poem that's ever been written. In fact, I would argue that it'd be more fun probably to try and write the worst thing that's ever been written. But, but that's just a reminder, you know, using those stark terms is just a way to remind myself that that's, um, that's really what I'm going for. That's really the only thing I'm really going for ever is to, um, get something yeah maybe it's good you know or maybe i like it and maybe it does feel like something that i want to share or sing to somebody um but it doesn't always feel that way and and i feel like those the those times where it isn't like that were all part of getting to something i did want to sing but it but I get the same level of probably satisfaction at the end of the day from any, any, any one piece of um, whatever we would you call output or, you know, like yeah. just something to show for what you did all day. And, or something that, you know, I like, I think I describe it in the book and I've said it many, uh, many times to people talking about this is like, I like the idea that I have the power to make something that wasn't there when the day started. And at the end of the day, I can point to and said, well, at least I did that. <laughs> yeah. We have a couple of, we were maybe going to flash up a couple of works of art from the Art Institute just to sort of like touch on them. And there's one that feels like it could be the right one to just bring up right here since we're talking about this in the context of routine and habit and schedule and, and also this question of inspiration. Um, Devin, maybe you could just, put the, um, uh, the Philip Guston painting up. This is a painting that's in the Art Institute collection and it's by the painter Philip Guston. Um, it's called Couple in Bed, 1977. And it's uh, Philip Guston and his wife Musa in bed and you know they're cuddled up, but he's clutching his uh, beloved um, uh, brushes and uh, I thought this was a nice one to just the, the, the kind of 
constancy of creative uh, activity and the uh, idea also of having a, a of having that um, one eye on what you're working on all the time sort of sensibility. <laughs> uh, and I had a, a little quick quote from Gustin that I wanted to read, if that's okay. Uh, it's from an interview that he did uh, right around the time that this painting was made. And he says, I think that creating is a double process. You have to be sophisticated as hell and innocent as hell at the same time. It's a real impossibility, but I think that's what it is. And I think that's what all the great ones would say too. If you ask me what happens, do I think first and make a mark or make the mark and then think? I'm having a baby. I don't know. I don't want to know that much about it. I just want to have that baby. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it feels like uh, it just felt like that relates to some of what you're talking about in the book, uh, in, you know, just in terms of um, that idea of it being a, it's a daily process, um, but it's also not a daily process that you can make, a, um, you can't make a, a schema for necessarily. Like you can, you can, you can have a bunch of, uh, of exercises. For instance, you get seven specific exercises to try to, really get people's creative juices flowing, but they don't necessarily, like doing them doesn't necessarily give you a song. Right. Um, they all give you, they all give you something, um, but it, you know, it might not be a song, but yeah, there's, uh, I definitely don't think that, um, that I'm ever not really writing because I do it so much that um, that part of my, the way my brain works is activated on a daily basis. And so it, it's kind of something that my mind likes to do. So it, when it's, when things are idle, you know, like sitting around, there's a lot of sitting around and staring at the wall involved in making stuff, making stuff up. And, and yeah, the idea of, did I make the mark first and then think or think and then make the mark? That, uh, that's that kind of thing that happens so quickly that toggling back and forth between, um, you're making a million different little decisions over and over and over again, especially um, that you don't, eventually you don't even realize you're making them. It's just like you, you've just trained yourself to get to something that you like, that's pleasant to you or pleasing or satisfying or, or uh, exciting to you or moving or, you know, but you, you kind of, you kind of balance that scale um, unconsciously, I think, over time by, by, by continuing a practice, by having, you know, in another uh uh, discipline, you would call it beginner's mind or, you know, something along those lines. And um, yeah, I think you, I, I think it's really good to remind yourself uh, of what it was like to be a child or, or, you know, inspired amateur or, um, you know, um, I, tr I, I don't think that I don't quite understand how a lot of other people work, to be honest. And, and I, I, I just, you know, I'm sharing how I work and I think it's, it has the potential to be universal to other types of creativity and things like that. But I'm talking as a person who has never achieved any kind of virtuosity on my instrument. And so I feel like I can really relate to people that feel like they can't do this because of some of those uh, what people have thought probably is a re requirement for certain yeah. levels of achievement in music or some you know or whatever um, and you would think that the world would be disabused of that notion by now seeing how many of the the great I don't know originators of different uh, art movements and things that have have come at it from uh, from 
less academic approaches and you know there's so much that gets i don't know misread and then, then reinterpreted in, in a, an exciting way yeah because the because you, you can only do so much you know I, I always worry about I always worry about people that can do everything that they hear in their head you know <laughs> I find that like that that seems to be that would be pretty hard to deal with I mean let me I'll just read a teeny bit from your from your book uh it's such a beautiful section I think you say uh uh there's always a blurry line between aptitude and gift Someone might have a certain aptitude and they might train themselves to be a practitioner of something and others might have an artistic gift. And I look, uh, I look at the artistic gift as more about communication and the ability to be oneself and not just about being able to execute a piece of music perfectly. To me, showing up with a reliably open heart and a will to share whatever spirit you can muster is what resonates and transcends technical per perfection. I mean, that such a beautiful way of, and, and again, very open way of suggesting that. And, and I, I think it's, you know, to go back to this question of demystifying, what's remarkable about it to me is just the whole notion of like writing of you, uh, a songwriter that a lot of people, you know, we all cherish your songs and, and are dazzled by them and amazed by them and do think they have virtuosity in them, right? Like I, I think that I listen to your your songwriting, and I think I, I would have a very hard time coming up with the kinds of combinations of images that you come up with. And what you do is really so again very open handedly say, "Let me give you some idea about how some of that came to be." Mm -hmm. Where I think the impulse for a lot of people would be to be very secretive about it and be to to uh, preserve or promote a kind of mystical uh, sense of inspiration rather than saying, you know, how I came up with some of that is I put a group of verbs and a group of nouns in a line and I made little cross lines between them and yeah. came up with some unexpected. Uh, or could you talk maybe a little bit about the conversation technique? Because I think that's one that's such an interesting, uh, one of the exercises you have comes from this conversation technique that you developed. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the conversation idea is, is very similar to almost any um, idea where you just take a transcript. You could even take a transcript of this interview or this, you know, this conversation. And if you look at it long enough um, and you start to take some of the language out of its context in this conversation, it would come alive in in, a, in an unexpected ways and and I and, and it's it's just a way to generate excuse me ideas now that's why I don't worry about like I'm show, a magician showing somebody how to do a trick or something because I don't think that putting one strange noun next to an uncommon verb <laughs> is poetry but i think it's hard to do that within an, without an idea being generated and the idea is what i want the idea is is the exciting part and um i'm not going to find have the same idea that somebody else is going to have and 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 vice versa they're going to they're going to they're going to go somewhere different from that idea if they're not just looking at it, and I don't know if I make it clear enough in my book, but that's not the end. That's the beginning of, of, mm -hmm. of the, you know, the uncovering of some, some beauty or some meaning. And, and it's there at everybody's fingertips all the time. You just have to be willing to like embrace some randomness and ex embrace some ways to kind of you know, just kind of stimulate your, your own story, your own, whatever, what own story you want to tell or your own feeling. Um, um, I just trust that more than me saying, oh, wow, I want to write a song about this um, thing because it would be really cool if I had a song about this thing. Yeah. 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 And like, I, I was going to show everybody how smart I am because I have this like 
song that's really poignant about this thing. I don't ever come at it like that. I, I like I always come at it like, God, I wonder what some crazy things being presented to my mind will make how they will how I will make sense out of it. And 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 then you start to make those like rapid fire toggle decisions back and forth that that are unpredictable you know, like you know for from from one individual to the next it's so interesting because that idea um of like for instance using cut up techniques you know which is one of the exercises which is um uh there there was a there's an interview with William Burroughs, who was one of the people who um, used that technique a lot, like in Naked Lunch, for instance, mm -hmm. where he was asked about um, John Cage. And John Cage also used uh, cut up techniques in various ways to come up with chance procedures. Mm -hmm. And Burroughs said, you know, the, the difference between Cage and me is that you know, Cage wants to use that technique to go all the way out there as an experimental technique purely. Right. So that you go all the way out there and then what it is that you come up with is what you end up with. And mm -hmm. you're left with something that you have to navigate as opposed to what Burroughs wanted, which was like this idea, I'm going to cut this thing up. I'm going to see what I get. And then it's more akin to what you're talking about. Then there's going to be an idea that comes from that, that I'm going to use either as part of a narrative or as part of, or because the language is rich or it suggests something and then gives me a new feeling or a new idea that I go ahead with. Right. Which I think, I think cage is cage is testing the limits of how much the audience can do that for themselves. Yeah. You know, how right. much of it are they going to put together? How much are they, what are they? And I, and it's a really democratized and beautiful concept behind that chance operation thing. I've really been inspired by, you know, reading his, reading John Cage more than listening to John Cage in a lot yeah. of cases for me personally. Um, but, but yeah, that's like, th that is the farthest out there of, of um, that concept, you know, the, the idea that you just have to trust that the world is going to make this beautiful and we're going to take it. I'm going to take myself out of it completely. And um, yeah, I, 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 I love that idea, but I still love songs and I still love, you know, <laughs> training myself to be, a, a, you know, a person because I love songs that I want to take these ideas and put them into a shape that I think underlines the things that I see beautiful in them, underlines the meaning that I think is there. And um, I very rarely just left something be what it ended up being from some chance, you know, similarly chance type of uh, exercise. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, we're at this place, Devin, let's put up one other piece here just for a couple of seconds. Just let's look at this George Georg Basilet's uh, uh, work from about 1976, just because it's Mm -hmm. such a good example of what we're talking about in a way of like breaking pattern or something like that. Basilitz in the sixties began painting figures upside down. And as a way, I think of challenging himself as a painter and then also uh, challenging one to see the image in a completely different way, which relates to what we're talking about in a certain respect, I think. Sure. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I rem you know, that just makes me think about um, more the the instrument side of, or the musical side of what it is that I do and how, uh, how well-worn some of the paths become that, you know, when you're writing songs and, and, especially, you know, kind of folk oriented music and a lot of pop oriented music that isn't particularly complicated. Um, you can, you can feel kind of, uh, uh, it's just one of the things that you have to get out of the way is that is the uniformity of some of the shapes and, and, and you're, 
your inclination to put your hand in the same shapes and your mus muscle memory and and you're just trying to come up with a new piece of music and a lot of times the part that gets maybe less inspiring to yourself and you're not stop entertaining I, I feel like I stop entertaining myself when I feel like that and um so yeah the same impulse uh in in what I do would mean that I would maybe take the song I'm working on and pick up a different guitar that's in a completely different tuning and see what it sounds like just playing the same shapes <laughs> yeah and, and a lot of it's going to be completely atonal or long and then eventually you can kind of figure out um but you don't have any idea what's you know when you grab the, the neck on the guitar i i like not knowing what sound is going to come out <laughs> and and when it's in standard tuning and it's an acoustic guitar that i've played my whole life um i i could generally predict what's going to happen in a certain hand position or whatever uh so that's one of the ways i take myself out of it musically musically is and when i'm uh, that painting i you were saying he's like decided he's going to start painting upside down yeah and and yeah that would be uh uh very very similar to um yeah this i think that's a very similar impulse yeah, I think he went through a phase where he actually turned the figures sideways and broke them in half for a while, and then they went all the way upside down. Um, have they been shown wrong, the like upside down? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure in their day they were. That's yeah. probably true. Yeah. Um, I, I really love the way that you deal with the. Uh, um, really, I'm sorry. Really, I'm yeah. gonna interrupt. I actually wrote a song recently called "Country Song Upside Down," which was it just occurred to me. I was kind of <laughs> kind of weird. Yeah, perfect. Uh, it was like, it was the same concept. What would a what would a country song sound like if it was upside down? I'm not I'm not exaggerating or or like I'm not making that up. That's that's awesome. Crazy. Oh, I really want to know that. I want to know that lyric now. Do you can you can you give us a little lyric? Uh, was, um, I found a, I found a song upside, uh, I found a song upside down, a country song, like a trout, dying sky and dying water, rainbow flickering out. Yeah. Wow. That's really, that's really nice in, uh, in context. That's so great. I really, I want to say, you know, uh, uh we're going to open it up for questions shortly, but I want to just say how, you handle something so difficult in the book with such a plum that it's it's it almost just kind of moves right along. But you know, it's very hard to talk uh, to um, to write uh, about to a, an um, an audience, a non specialist audience, about how to deal with the musical side of something like this. Mm -hmm. And I think the suggestions that you give, because you really break it down into this idea that you know it's about um, stockpiling and um, combining stockpiling lyrics and words and 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 stockpiling sounds and uh, and melodies and and then eventually combining them in one way or another and the musical side of that is very difficult to get into without immediately um, intimidating people and I felt like I feel like you do a really beautiful job of doing it in a way that made me really want to go out and get my phone going and you know <laughs> listen to some birds and find a squeaky wheel and stuff like that yeah I mean um well you know especially recorded sound and how ac accessible recorded sound is to almost everyone walking around today with a with a little handheld recorder in their in their pocket or in their hand most often when they're walking around it's like literally right at their fingertips um you walk by sounds all the time that you maybe wouldn't wouldn't think that you want to hear them again but if you press record there's so many things that I think you would want to hear again. And, and that's not that much different than a lot of songs that you're going to listen to in your life. There are a lot of songs that you're going to hear once and you're never going to hear again. And then there are going to be songs that become your longtime companions or for your friends that you want to hear that become somewhat, uh, you know, I, I always think of it as like a circle of friends that you've like, you've, 
you know, you've developed a relationship with, but uh, your decision to make that recording without having any musical ability whatsoever is a musical impulse in my opinion. And, um, and con could contribute to the idea or I would expand my notion of a song to include that. I would expand my notion of a song to include being able to reliably recreate almost any moment, you know? Um, I think we all have songs that we don't acknowledge as songs. I think that um, uh, the way some people answer the phone in a, in a particular way every time you call them is, it's kind of like their theme song, <laughs> you know, yeah. you yeah. know, the, just the lilt in their voice or how they say hello or, you know, I think we all we all kind of create our personalities around sounds that we make and and um, and not just sounds, but but uh, uh, hand gestures, way, the way we move our, our bodies, the 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 way we touch other people's shoulders, we, you know, those those things. I willingly want to ex uh, expand my idea of, of music and sound to include um, because I, I just, I'm not smart enough to put it into a coherent philosophy, but I believe that those are all related to song in, in my, the, um, in that you teach uh, say you you pat your child's back as they're when they're scared or they're 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 crying or something like that, and you you've passed that that hand motion and that that sensation along to them, and then they have a child and they, they and they do that, or they don't have a child but they have a friend, and that 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 song gets communicated over and over and over again, and and it's like okay, well that's how we uh, that's something nobody's written. Nobody's written how to do that. Nobody's mm -hmm. told anybody how to do that. And that's what songs are the best at is like communicating things that we don't know how to write down, communicate things that we don't have any other way of communicating. And so um, those are all very song like uh, textures to our world, you know? So beautiful. That's so that I, I love that idea. And it's really at the heart of the, the book is that the, is this expanded notion of what a song is in this expanded. I mean, you say at one point in the book that it, you're that the people that you think are the best musicians are the best listeners. And I, I could not agree with you more. I'm, I'm really only, uh, my favorite musical experiences are shared musical experiences. I've never been a very good uh, listener on earphones by myself. Actually, I have to admit that's kind of an alien thing for me. And it's so much a part of the book is that expanded notion of not only what a song is, but what a song's for and how it functions in the world as a tool of communication. So beautiful. Well, thank you. The, yeah, the, the, the act of creating is one side of the book and then the, the song itself is, 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 should be really loose as a definition as the end product, in my opinion, because, you know, I do think that the, the, the act of it uh, coming to something song-like is, is, is a really, very worthwhile uh, impulse to indulge. And, and then the, the song itself, uh, I mean, I, I think it should help. I just think <laughs> it should help somebody somewhere. And I think it's hard to make a song that doesn't help somebody somewhere. I think it's, it's almost impossible, you know, like, um, it's like, uh, if we have music, we're not alone. If as long as we have music, we're not yeah. alone. And yeah. It, it, I, you know, I don't, I, I think that's something very old that somebody said, and I don't know who, but it's, 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 it resonates with me because it sounds, it sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are definitely not alone right now. And uh, we have lots and lots of questions uh, and an amazing number of questions. Um, I'm going to hope that we can go a little over because I've gone just a tad over and hopefully we'll be able to do 10 minutes worth of uh, Q and a here. That all right with you. I'm going to answer every last question. No, I'm just <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a handful of these questions. Uh, I'm going to start out with one from Joachim. 
uh, who says, Neil Young once said, it's all one song. How does this statement fit into your songwriting approach? Um, I don't, I don't disagree with it. I'd have to contemplate it a little bit to, uh, I don't think it's incompatible with anything that I've said. I think that um, there is a, a, um, a great sense of being a part of a continuum when you realize that this is just a human impulse. This is something that occurred to me as a kid when I was really worried about being punk rock enough or like, you know, feeling like there were lines in the sand being drawn all the time between the music that I liked. And then there was music that I wasn't supposed to like um, because I liked this one type of music you weren't supposed to like Neil Young or, you know, and I, um, I really felt like, isn't it all just people making noise, <laughs> making sound? Like, hey, I'm here, I'm here. And, and, and uh, so, yeah, I think that it, you know, I can, I can definitely uh, endorse the, not, the concept of it all being one song, <laughs> you know. But Neil says a lot of stuff that is, is uh, very, I think, in, in keeping with the spirit of, a lot, of, a lot of the things I say, I th I'd say. I have a question from Thomas who asks, how do you push through when you get stuck creatively? <clears throat> um, well, the first thing I, 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 I think I talk about in the book a little bit, I, I don't tend to get stuck creatively because I kind of don't believe that... I think what being stuck means is that you are you've started judging what you what you're getting. <laughs> what you know, I think you're much more likely to have what would what people call a writer's block um, when you are asking too much of what it is that you're doing. You know, like basically, I just think that that when somebody says I'm having writer's block, I just think, well, you just don't like what you're making. <laughs> you're not really not making anything. You've just decided you don't like it. <laughs> And I, I think that you write through that. You know, I think all the time that I write, I, I really do write songs that I don't like sometimes because I know that if I don't go through this song, I won't really get to the next one. <laughs> you know, um, and the, the, the songs like that really are like, oh, I, I mean, I am making the judgment. Oh, this is beneath me. I, 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 I like oh, this is this is really puerile and <laughs> stupid. And you know, and I, but I also think, yeah, but it just came to me. So just do it. <laughs> it's not going to take that, that long to finish this song. Do it, and 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 then I start to like the next thing that happens. Or you know, maybe it maybe it takes a while. But I think that you just have to identify that what writer's block really is, is that you just don't like what you're making. It's not that you can't make something. It's a little bit like being paralyzed by, again, by being paralyzed by self-doubt, like, or by, by self-judgment. Like if you are doing something and you don't like it, and rather than just working through it, you let that be a thing that stops you. Yeah. That's right. The like, I think it, like the internal dialogue that I can hear in my head, like if, with the notion like being blocked is like, this isn't smart enough. <laughs> this isn't going to tell anybody how smart you are, <laughs> or this isn't going to show anybody how funny you are, or, you know, like this. Uh, and, and you can't ask, you can't ask that of the things that you make all the time. In fact, you think you're better off never asking those questions of it, you know? I have a question from Whitney who says, in terms of routine, how have you adapted to the big swaths of grief and loss as the pandemic continues? Are there days when it comes easier, days when you don't create? I'm always trying to get that routine going for me, but some days are a wash. And she adds, thanks for being so frank about your addiction recovery and your books and songs too. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we're all struggling to comprehend the uh the devastating amount of lives lost in the past year or over a year now and um 
I think that those, I think it's beyond our comprehension in, in a lot of ways. Um, but what I feel like I've, I think writing about mortality, writing about um, gratitude for, you know, expressing some joy of being alive. Those are two kind of yin and yang things that have been obsessions of mine to write about for a long, long time, I think, is this like um, this idea that, um, I don't know, it's not, I'm not the, I'm probably, that's probably one of the main obsessions all writers have, all songwriters have, or all, you know, authors, it's like there's some element of you're making this thing and, and it's going to go away <laughs> and you're, you're going to go away. And that's all, that's not a thought that's ever very far from my mind. Um, so the fact that I write a lot about that all the time, it, I can't help but feel like some of it is even more focused because of the world that we're, we're currently swimming around in. Um, in other words, I find myself putting references to death in, in, in songs that are about entirely different subjects. And, you know, and I'm just trying not to be too harsh about that, that impulse. Um, sometimes I go back and revise them and try and find a way to like soften that side of it because I know it's an obsession. But I just like I guess what I'm trying to say to answer the question, I just find it creeping in there more and more, I think. And did I go away? You you went away, but you're still audible. So huh. we, we can hear you. So I'll ask you maybe a couple more questions if that's okay. okay. And you're uh you've disappeared in fact. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the whole point. That's what I've been trying to say. <laughs> um, now, now there's a weird picture of me up there, but I, I'm happy to answer any. Maybe Susie's coming, so maybe she'll figure it out. What happened? Did your phone die? No. What it says, uh, I can't see what it says. No. Well, well, we can hear you. Okay. okay. So maybe I'll, uh, Zach has a nice question. How, uh, sorry, have you found that there's a correlation between the level of excitement you feel when writing a particular song and the song's reception, i.e. do the songs you're most excited about turn out to be your most popular songs? <laughs> Almost never. Uh, no, the songs, um, the songs that I find the most satisfying to myself, to um, my own listening experience, um, tend to be uh, the least popular. <laughs> they tend to, honestly, they tend to be the least popular songs. Because um, I, I can wallow in a lot more morbidity, I think, than... Uh, um, then maybe the the general public wants to uh, wants to put up with. <laughs> I have a, another question from Paul. Uh, most everyone who plays music starts learning to play other people's songs, and then at some point starts wanting to write and perform their own songs. Do you remember first getting that desire, and can you describe how it developed? I got. I think that my first experiences listening to music, I wasn't entirely uh, sure that it wasn't me making the music. I honestly think that there was some uh, mirror neurons firing or some sense of empathy or something like that. But it, I think that's one of the reasons it felt so liberating and exciting to me um, uh, because was was the feeling that I could do that I'm I'm doing that or like uh, uh, I would uh, I would honestly never listen to records for and I think still to this day without projecting it to into the recording some degree of myself some some sense of well, I'm doing that you know like um, <clears throat> it's a very very liberating feeling to feel like uh, I'm standing on stage making this sound. And I, I don't think if I could, I think I would have ever been able to do it without having been able to transport myself into that, that idea of, of performance or, you know, being the maker uh, versus the listener. 
And over time, it's like kind of my philosophy has become that that really is literally 50% of the equation. You know, the, the consciousness of the listener is making it, is putting it together. Uh, and uh, so you should, should take some ownership of that and be, and that's, that's why it's, that's why it's such a joyous thing to, to do or so, so um, such a relief or such a you know, powerful presence in your life to, to, to put that, put that thing together that makes you feel that way. That's awesome. I don't know if that answers the question, but, 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 but okay, I'll answer the question very, very succinctly. I don't remember not feeling, I don't remember feeling like I couldn't do that even before I could do it. I told people I could do it before I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I, that's a, that's a very, very nice answer. I mean, it's a great answer. Nancy, can I continue for a, a, a question or two more? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. As long as Jeff, you in. You okay? I'm here. I'm fine. I, I'm just apologize. My my camera went out. We got the little cat. <laughs> we yeah, got the cat, cat that's, that's saying something crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you just put a picture of me up there. Or something. Uh, so I have a question from Liz. How and when in your development as a songwriter did you realize that you had a process for creating? Was it more a case of codifying what you were already doing or did you devise a series of exercises through which you got songs that you were, that were better than ones you'd done previously? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, well, I certainly didn't have any uh, formal training in the, in the idea of, developing a process like um like one you might get at the art institute or you know or um it's not something i it's definitely self-taught the idea um of using these exercises and you know i think it really grows out of just you know just dissatisfaction with things that i was getting out of myself and <clears throat> I very, very clearly remember at some point wanting to become better at writing lyrics because I had always, I, the idea of writing lyrics down had always been daunting to me. So I decided really early on in Uncle Tupelo and early in Wilco that no song was worth writing if I had to write it down you know, that I should be able to remember all of my lyrics. And well, what, what ended up happening is the, the, I have very few lyrics in all of those songs <laughs> and, and they're very simple and very easy to remember. And that is good in some ways, but it, but it, it wasn't very satisfying for very long because I, I definitely admired a lot of uh, great lyricists and uh, other people's work. And I wanted to figure out if I could express myself with more complexity than that. And, um, and then I think through that, in, that desire, I realized that one of the only ways you get better at that is through developing a process and uh, trial and error, I think taught me that, that um, the more I take myself out of it, the more I like it at the end of the day. And, and, and that's what process helps you do, I think. I think that's good. I yeah. think this is a good, I think this is a good place for us to stop. There's so many questions, but I think that was a really nice, uh, a nice place for us to um, close. So uh, I'm going to say, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Really great to talk with you. What a pleasure. Thank, thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about this stuff. I, I really do love it. I love talking about it and, and um, thank you. It was, it was great. Great to chat with you. Great. Thanks so much to both Jeff and John for this very illuminating conversation, fun conversation. And in a way, the sound effects earlier, I think, really made it feel like we were all just hanging out at Jeff's house. So that worked out. Um, so thanks to everyone on Zoom and also on YouTube for tuning in and for sharing all your thoughtful questions and comments. So with that, on behalf of the Art Institute and Innovation and Creativity, have a great evening, everyone. Take care.
All right. Are you off? Yeah. Do we have uh, are are we are we offline here?